Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. And please make sure to shut down your uh, cell phones before we begin the lecture. Um, distinguished uh, guest speaker, Professor Mildred Dresselhaus, her daughter and her husband, her daughter Mayan and her husband, uh, President of the Technion, Professor Peretz Lavi, Vice President of the Technion, uh, Senior Vice President, Deans, faculty members, students, uh, this important guests, they came specifically for your lecture. Uh, welcome to the Technion. Uh, we are very honored and privileged to have Professor Mildred Dresselhaus today as our guest speaker in the Shalom Ziloni Distinguished Women in Science series. Her lecture title is My 50 Years of Carbon. Professor Mildred Dresselhaus is an institute professor of electrical engineering and physics at MIT. She is known as the queen of carbon <laughs> and has gone a long way since she began her career as faculty member at MIT in 1968 when women students composed only 4% and the rate of women faculty was even lower. Millie was born in the Bronx and her first talent was discovered in music. Millie went to a music school. She plays violin and viola and until today Millie is an enthusiastic chamber music player. She did her undergraduate studies in Hunter College for Women where it was only natural for her to study physics because there were no men to tell her that physics is not for women. She then got her master degree at Radcliffe College at Harvard University and her PhD on superconductivity in Chicago in 1958. Millie is known for her research on nanoscience and nanostructure and specifically on carbon science and carbon nanostructure. Millie has co-authored more than, I am not going to ask you to guess because you'll never guess it. Guess it. It's um, 1,400 publications. <laughs> and she has five patents. Her research has made an impact not only on the academic world, but she has also influenced policy makers on energy related issues. She served as the director of the Office of Science at the United States Department of Energy and as the chair of the governing board of the American Institute of Physics and president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, Dr. Dresselhaus is a member and was also the treasurer of the National Academy of Science and she's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and of other pre prestigious associations. Uh, Millie received numerous awards, including the U.S. National Medal of Science, the Vannevar Bush Award for the National Science by the National Science uh, Board, and she received 29 honorary doctorates worldwide, among them also from the Technion, which she says that she appreciates even more. Millie has also visited the Technion when her children were still young, and her daughter Marianne, uh, who is here, still remember where they lived on campus at the graduate students' housing. Uh, I told her that now we're going to have a, a camp, no, how do we call it, a camp village of graduate students coming soon. Uh, Professor Dresselhaus is also very active in promoting women in science and technology. She received the Carnegie Foundation grant to encourage women to study in traditional male-dominated fields such as physics. Millie serves as a wonderful mentor to women students and faculty in science and technology, as is also testified by two women faculty here, uh, Professor Efrat Lifshitz for chemistry, who considers Millie to be her mentor, and, uh, do, and Professor Gitti Fry from uh, material engineering, who spent some time with Millie in working in her lab. Physics remain her family in her family, and now one of her granddaughter is an undergraduate student working on carbon nanotubes, just like grandma. I'm very honored and pleased to have uh, Millie, uh, Professor uh, Mildred Dresselthorst as our guest speaker today. But before I invite her to come, I, I would like to invite the president of the Technion, Professor Peretz Lavi, to convey his greetings. Thank you, Mia. Our distinguished 
guest speaker, Marian and her husband, my colleagues from the Technical Administration, deans, faculty, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Indeed, it is a, a decided pleasure to welcome our distinguished guest lecturer, Professor Mildred Dresselhaus, to the Technion, to this wonderful event today. These annual lectures are a source of deep satisfaction, as each year we bring brilliant women scientists to the Technion and are able to focus on the increasingly vital role in which women play in science. Science was a subject which, until this current generation, was considered unsuitable for the female mind, despite outstanding evidence of the contrary. It is not the brilliance of the female mind that has changed. It is the political correctness of giving women their full due. Professor Dresselhaus was able to bring her considerable talents to fulfillment because of her personal determination and still a grit at the time when the full realization of a woman's abilities could not be taken for granted. As you heard, she was born in, the, in New York, in Brookline, to an immigrant family in a rather poor neighborhood. It was clear to Millie that she must be a very good student to make it in the world. She studied in a city college to become a school teacher. But in her second year at this college, she met Rosalind Yalo, a brilliant scientist who in 1977 became the second woman ever to win the Nobel Prize in Medicine for her work on the development of radio amino assay. At that time, a revolutionary method of quantifying minute amounts of biological substances in the body using radioactive isotopes. Rosalind convinced her that she should go into career in science. And as we use today, the rest is history. Last night, during a dinner in honor, Millie told me that Rosalind Yalo was teaching in that college as a temporary teacher because she couldn't find any other job. In 1941, when Rosalind Yalo finally found a job as a teaching assistant in the College of Engineering, in the University of Urbana-Champaign, she was the only woman among its 400 members. The dean of the faculty congratulated her and said that she was the first woman there since 1917. Years later, in the 60s, when Professor Dresselhaus joined MIT, she was assigned to look over the admission programs because MIT needed someone to evaluate women applicants. At that time in MIT, there were different criteria for men and for women applicants. In 1990, she received the U.S. National Medal of Science for her contributions to engineering science and her contribution to women in science. Today, we live in an environment where women's role in science is no longer a source of amazement. However, despite the basic change in attitude and statistics, there is still room for a progress. Perhaps the most relevant example is our own school, the Technion. In the Technion, we are awarded honorary doctor of science degree to only four women out of more than 60 recipients since 1958. The first woman in 19 89 was no other than Rosalind Yalo, your mentor. She was followed by you in 1994. The citation for honorary doctorate for Professor Dresselhaus reads as follow. In recognition of her outstanding contributions to science of condensed matter, in particular to the understanding of carbon-based materials and in appreciation of her guiding influence on scientific policy in the United States and throughout the world. Since then, only two more women have been selected for the honor. We assume that the numbers will grow as changing demographics are reflected in increasing number of women who reach that stage in their careers 
when such honors can be bestowed. Perhaps a positive sign in this direction is the fact that one third of the new cadre of 29 new faculty members who just joined the Technion are women in all fields of science. We are grateful to Shalom Ziloni for the opportunity he has given us to showcase outstanding women like Professor Mildred Dresselhaus, who can serve as role models and inspiration to our current scholars and students. Mr. Ziloni is an exceptional friend. He has been sensitive to our needs and requirements of this institute and has left his mark in every corner of the campus in every aspect of student life. As president of the Technion, it has been my unique pleasure to get to know him and call him a personal friend. Much of the phenomenal growth of the Technion in the past decade can be attributed to our friend Shalom Ziloni. I know that you will enjoy hearing Professor Dresselhaus and I wish to thank her personally for agreeing to be with us today and to honor us with her lecture. We are looking forward to sharing your 50 years with Carbon. Thank you very much, Mili. token, small token of appreciation, and this is the book on the war of languages that preceded the opening of the Technion, 1913. The war of, of languages. languages. Yeah. Thank you, Miriam. Okay, I, I'm going to talk about my 50 years working on carbon. That's the announcement. It's uh, a real pleasure to be back here again at the Technion. Uh, it's been a, a, a few years, not too many. I, I think I've been here uh, between the time of my honorary degree and the present. So, and I, I hope to keep coming, coming back. Maybe uh, I'll come back more often now. So, with, with this uh, new, uh, adventure. So uh, I, I start out uh, my talk um, uh, uh, thinking that um, when we're all finished, I'd like to leave some time for discussion. So if 50 minutes, I should talk for 40 minutes and then, or I can, 50 is okay? Still 50, okay. So uh, I started out uh, back in 1960, maybe late laser pointer. Is there such a thing here? Uh, yeah, paper. Okay, so uh, I start out here in 1960, and uh, th this is the. T uh, I finished my uh, uh, PhD and my postdoc, and I got a job. So the first thing they told me when I got my first uh, independent job is. We don't want you to work on anything you know anything about. We want you to switch fields, work in a new area uh, of physics. So, okay, uh, so what was I going to do? Uh, I thought I would stay with solid state because at least I knew something about that. But uh, actually I had um, in my training uh, studied with Enrico Fermi. He's the guy that taught me about physics. And uh, what he taught me was it was very important to be able at the time, uh, this is back and forth, yeah. Uh, at, at the time I started my career, it was, he told me that uh, it was very important to be able, when you start your research, to be able to work in any field of physics. So, Condensed matter was fine, but if somebody told me sometime I had to work in atomic physics or do something else, I could switch around. And that was really very, very good advice because you heard in the introduction, I did many things in other areas that I had to direct, including biology and chemistry and whatever, and I was running the Office of Science for the United States government. So uh, if you learned something from this talk, it's good to know about many things. And so I know that there are many people in the audience that are not in condensed matter, perhaps, 
Uh, I hope you can get something from my lecture. So that's my goal. So I started out in 1960, and I had to switch fields. And I didn't know what to work on. So I decided that I'd see what other people are doing, because I was going to work in condensed matter, but I didn't know what it was. At that time, everybody practically was studying semiconductors. It was the very beginning of silicon age. And I decided that was not for me. I didn't want to do what everybody else was doing. So what was different, I was looking for something that had something fundamentally different about its energy. Energy is something that everybody understands. So the en relation between energy momentum in this system is different from any other uh, condensed matter system. It's linear in K rather than quadratic in K, K being momentum. So for me, that was different, and that's how I got into something that was totally different. I see Danny Sheckman here. He also worked in something totally different from everybody else. Five-fold symmetry. People didn't think five-fold street symmetry uh, existed. And condensed matter, he showed us that that was not true. And so it's good to work in other areas. OK, so uh, take home message. So here's linear E versus K. Yes, something wrong? Oh. Well, I, I don't have to use this. No? No, I, I didn't know. Okay, just, I, 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 thank you for telling me. I, but, uh, I, I just worked that way. Okay, so uh, here we are. Uh, I start here early history, 1960. Uh, carbon science. Uh, you'll see this is a number of papers per year. When I started, there was nothing. <laughs> it was sort of these papers three a year. That, I think I made three papers a year. So <laughs> that's me. Uh, so uh, that, that's, that's sort of what I started. And I'm going to tell you now in my talk, go very quickly through the decades. So early times, I worked on graphite. Because we, when I started, we didn't even know graphite. So that's the most fundamental thing. So that's where I started. And then I took one layer of, of uh, carbon and put other things between it. So that was the very beginning of intercalation physics. There was nobody working in the field practically when I started. So this is intercalation physics. And then in the uh, 1980s, late, late 1980s, I started working on fullerenes. Fullerenes were discovered in 1985, not by me, but by somebody else. But I started doing spectroscopy. And so I was working in that field. So that's yellow. So started in here. And uh, then nanotubes came along. And I was involved with the beginning of nanotubes. So started working in that. And then, uh, then I came back to graphene. That's re really where I started the very beginning. So, because linear versus E versus K is a single layer of carbon. So, I didn't think anybody would ever make it, and I didn't ever thought I would ever work on it. But 50 years later, approximately, I came back to where I started. So, that's my hi history in carbon. I started someplace, worked on a lot of things, and then came back to the beginning. So, okay, now to go on to what I did. So this is the work in the 1960s. I told you we didn't know much about graphite. That was the place to start. So uh, uh, the most important work I did was in this slide. At the time I started, we didn't know anything about electrons and holes. In fact, when people thought they were measuring electrons, they were really measuring holes. When they thought they were measuring holes, they thought they were really electrons. So electrons, of course, have negative charge. And holes is the absence of electrons. So when it's moving, it has a positive charge. It moves in the opposite way. And so that was my contribution, was identifying properly where electrons and holes existed in momentum space. Because in physics, we always evaluate the properties of material by thinking of them in reciprocal space. So that was the work of the 1960s, understanding carbon. Well, of course, ever since then, everybody uses this system. 
So I feel that was a pretty important thing. So uh, then I move in the 1970s, so 10 years forward. That's pretty fast, five minutes. So um, uh, here you see a single layer of carbon that's sandwiched between other uh, uh, species. So you might think of this as an, uh, potassium. Potassium here, chemistry. So we put a, a single layer of, of an alkali metal between. That, la that layer has one very free electron. It's transferred to the carbon, and it makes it n-type. So uh, this is the transfer of, of charge between uh, the intercalant and the carbon layer, so it changes its property. And so we study electronic properties and uh, uh, the, what the lattice was doing, everything about it. So that, we were, over 15 years we, we worked on that field. And uh, so here it shows uh, stage one. So we, this is one carbon layer between the intercalants, so we could have, in this part we have two carbon layers, and then we have three carbon layers. And you see, one carbon layer is really special. It looks very different from two and three. So we learned back in those early days this is, uh, that a single carbon layer is really a very, very special thing. That time, we only knew how to put it between other species. Very recently, we found out that you can make it all by itself. And that was a new revelation. And people like me, who worked for so many years, was really surprised how easy. And it was something we did day after day working on this problem. We would peel a piece of graphite until it was pretty thin. And then we, did, we got a nice surface. And we did optical experiments. <laughs> if we only thought to make one layer, it would have been more, more interesting. But sometimes you don't have the right idea until you know a lot more about something. So fundamental research is very important. And sometimes when people tell you, oh, you have to work on applications. Yeah, applications are important. They come. But fundamentals are also important. So that's another take home message for my talk today. So uh, we could put uh, that last time with donors, or we put molecules. And here we have molecules that take electrons from the carbon or make the p-type. So you can do either way, and that's intercalation compound. That was the research of the 70s. Uh, this is interesting here because you see that the, we studied the vibrational properties of the species that, put in, that were put in. And we found that the vibrational frequencies changed by 50%. That was a kind of an amazing result to us. Because usually when you modify perturbed something, it changes by a couple of percent, five percent. That's big. Here, 50 percent. So you can make really big changes in, in uh, systems in this way. Now I'm moving 10 years more forward. So um, now we're working on fullerenes. Fullerenes were discovered in 1985. Uh, we found uh, fullerenes, but we didn't know we found fullerenes. Well, we were doing this experiment uh, back in 1983 or so. Uh, we took a laser and we shot, uh, had it shine on carbon system. And if you put enough power in, it takes chunks of stuff out of the surface. Uh, and what we found out is that our clothes got very dirty. At the time we worked on the lab on this experiment, I came home with black clothes, had to throw it in the washing machine. So I knew something was wrong. And so I went to Exxon to ask them what was happening that we get such big chunks that make us so dirty. Uh, because at the time, uh, they advertised C2 or C3, only three carbon atoms, very small clusters. But we weren't getting uh, clusters of two and three. We were getting clusters that were big, like a C100. And we, when we went to, to um, uh, Exxon to tell them about this, they told us that they got up to C15. So I told them, go look some more. Go look up here. We didn't know what. And then fullerenes came. So, uh, but the Exxon people, they got this beautiful spectrum. But they didn't identify that 60 was bigger than anything else. That was small eight. 
and Curl at Croto that did that. And that was the discovery of, of the fullerenes. So we got into the fullerene business and we wrote this book on fullerenes. And we were interested in the spectroscopy. So that was work in the 80s and 90s. And so you can see here we have uh, infrared on the top and Raman spectroscopy. And this was kind of amazing. <coughs> we found oh, 200 different species or so. You could see this spectrum is very, very complicated. But we were able to understand all of this from group theory. And I bring this up because this is kind of the time of, of group theory. And I was teaching this group theory course in 1984. And I was just at the part of the course of teaching about fivefold symmetry. And the next week after I taught this, gave this lecture, here's this paper, Schechtman paper, uh, 1984, and uh, so he told me that in that paper, you read the paper, there's something special about, about five-fold symmetry. It actually exists. So the students, got to read, everybody got to read the paper, and uh, at the end of the semester, they were allowed to pick any topic that they wanted, and they could write their special paper. One, one of the homework assignments was what impressed you most about the course and tell us about it. And uh, I think about half the class selected Danny Sheckman's <laughs> paper. So it was kind of interesting. I thought he'd enjoy hearing about that. Anyway, so that's back in, in the 1990s uh, and 80s. So uh, you saw spectroscopy. We found out from doing that work that spectroscopy was really important and Raman spectroscopy in particular. So we started moving and, and using that for many other things. Before that time, we were doing many other subjects. But af after that, we started spe using more of our time doing Ram Raman spectroscopy. And I'll tell you more about that as I I'm, I'm go through my lecture. OK, so uh, in the 1980s, we also were working on carbon fibers. <clears throat> that was a side project. And that emerged from uh, uh, studying intercalation compounds and we found that, that uh, intercalation compounds were really very nice to study in fibers because they have a beautiful geometry. You can make them long and thin, and they were wonderful for doing transport measurements. So we were into that field, and, and we wrote a book on it for students because there was no good book that the students could understand that subject. So people got to know that book, and I got invited to uh, 1990 to a conference. And Rick Smalley got invited to the same conference, and he was talking on C60, because that was very hot at that time. And we were the two invited speakers, and then there were a few contributed papers. We just the workshop for one day. And uh, in the afternoon, mid-afternoon, they brought us to the table, the two invited speakers, and they had everybody else in the audience, and they started asking us questions. And the question that came up is, what's the connection between C60 and carbon fibers. So, you know, connection simple, C60, C70, C80. C70 was known at the time, and maybe you can make a single wall nanotube. So that's what came out of that conference, but nobody had made a single wall nanotube. That was just like graphene, figment of the imagination. So uh, what happened was right after that conference, I had two Japanese visitors that came, and they wanted to spend the year with me working on something. So I was excited about this uh, conference. And I said, let's, set, let's imagine that somebody could make uh, something like this thing. What would its properties be? Would it be interesting? Would it be interesting to even try to make this thing? And so uh, the prediction was if you could make it, it could either be a semiconductor or metallic depending on the orientation of the hexagons with respect to the axis. That's the simple terms, what we found out. Now, that was very, very unusual because no material was known yet at that time that had the same material that had those properties just depend, depending on geometry. But, but uh, OK, then, then we tried to make it and prove it. And uh, we did this. So here's what the idea is. 
So uh, we have graphene, we have, this is the carbon network of carbon atoms. We roll it up to make a nanotube. So, and it has just the one layer. And it has very few number of atoms, like 10. So imagine that you have 10 atoms and around the circumference. If you had an infinite number, it would be a cone, like graphene, we know today. But if you have only 10 atoms, then you have these cutting lines. You could only have 10 states. So if you have 10 states, you have to ha make 10, 10 black lines here, and that's it. So here they are. Uh, so the idea is these, these black lines can go any place. If one of them goes through this apex point, then we have a metal because the valence and conduction bands touch. So that's a metal. And if, it, if that doesn't happen, we have a semiconductor. So that's the theory behind it. It's a crazy idea, but it makes sense, and it's even right. So that was proved six, it took six years. You can imagine how slowly, this isn't so long ago, 1992, 20 years ago. It took us six, six more years to prove this. Everybody was happy with it. So, and another group proved it at the same time. Anyhow, uh, just to continue on, on this story, Here's the spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, radial breathing mode. Everybody knows radial breathing mode for nanotubes. And this is just the carbon G band that everybody knows, G for graphite. Uh, and this is the sort of band, so we know all of that. And from this work stem, the idea, okay, what we do with ensembles, that's interesting. But because every nanotube is different, has a slightly different geometry, it has different vibrational frequencies, so we should maybe try to do it on a single molecule level. So here's uh, a single nanotubes, and we pick out one of these, and we do spectroscopy. And we saw that the uh, spectra was different for every tube, and it was totally different for metallic and semiconducting, like here's the G-band. And you can see that this top one here is metallic, and the bottom one is semiconducting. You can see it's hugely different. So, Okay, we have a way to uh, distinguish between them, so there must be some difference. So, uh, so that was the beginning of, of uh, the single uh, nanotube spectroscopy, and now everybody does everything on single things, because in nanostructures, nano, every nanostructure is different from every other nanostructure. So it's very important to work at the single nanostructure level. So this is kind of, uh, has had many reper repercussions. Well, with that, nowadays we, we're now doing double wall nanotubes and more complicated because they have all these genders here with metallic and semiconducting. And we study this at the single nanotube level to understand the detail. I'm just bringing you into the modern age, so this is what we're currently doing in our lab, and other people are doing it also. And we do uh, first order processes. Here we conserve momentum, so it's first order. It's second order. We take a light coming in, creates a phonon, scatters to another place in the zone, comes back, and then gets recombined. That's the second order process. And uh, they both give a lot of information. So this tells us something about the zone center, the people, solid state people. And this tells us about all the different wave vectors in the Berlin zone. That's in short what kind of information you can do with spectroscopy. So uh, this is a summary of, of, at the single nanotube level, we could met, uh, probe the inner and outer tubes, semiconductor metallic independently, and find out the whole story about them, all their chiralities and everything. And uh, you do it in bundles, you just get a mixture of information, no details, but that's interesting, and it's all right because it gives you the ensemble. Ensembles are always interesting, but the individuals give you a lot more detailed information. And then we can make sheets. So this is graphene, and it shows you the spectra look different. And now I'm going to move to graphene. So this is doping. I won't spend time with that. Oh, triple walls. We, we do triple walls, and we have... Okay, this, this is more complicated. This is as far as we are going. I don't know, other people, maybe they want to go four walls, but this is where we stop, too, too complicated. At this level, you can really do physics and understand it. Beyond that, too complicated for me. 
So, and here's the way the spectrum look. And you could see there are three lines identified for the three components. But that's about it for us. So now I'm going to go to the last topic, which is graphene. And so I, that was nanotube. Now we go here. And I give the, the date 2004 because that's when that field mushroomed. So uh, let's start with that. The field really started also in the 1960s. 1962 is the first paper on a single layer of graphene. So it's a very old topic. We knew it in our minds in 1947. That was my first view graph. But nobody thought of an experiment to do. But this guy, boom, he's still alive. He's exactly my age within two months. <laughs> we're both 81 years old. <laughs> this is a long time ago. And uh, I called him up uh, because somebody said that he, he doesn't exist anymore. But I thought he might. So we looked, Googled him, found his telephone, called him up, and he remembers me from conferences. <laughs> and I asked him if he's still working. He says, a little bit. <laughs> so, okay, uh, this is real guy. And uh, so this is his paper, you can read the German here, Nin uh, 1962. Uh, but there was a big hiatus. Uh, he did this experiment, published the paper. Nobody thought anything of it. He didn't get any encouragement from anybody. And he didn't do much, and nobody else did much until, now I'll tell you graphene. So graphene has two atoms per unit cell, A and B atoms, those bar bipartite. And then if you, met, so here's A and B. On the next layer, A goes on top of A, but B gets staggered. So this is the structure. Simple, and I won't go beyond that. You just put these unit cells together, and there is graphene. Okay, and so if this is how, how it looks, so this is a single layer, and then the uh, energy momentum relation has these cones. And if you look right around here, you have linear E versus K. And this is what the people are all talking about, and all the noise and all the publications are all about that little bit. Okay, only those few wave vectors really close to the tip of those cones. That's where all the excitement is. Now you see, here's one layer and two layers. Almost look the same, don't they? You hardly tell a difference. This one is linear E versus K, and that's quadratic. This is monolayer, this is bilayer. Almost the same. Properties are grossly different because this is linear, and that's quadratic. It's amazing, isn't it? When you look at the big picture and you look at the minuscule. In condensed matter physics, the minuscule can make some very, very important differences. Maybe in biology it's the same, but I don't know enough about biology to know if this is the same throughout science. But uh, very, very small differences uh, can make very big impacts. Okay, so here is Again, single and double layer, tri-layer. Okay, moving right along here. Here's the paper, the Nobel Prize paper. This, uh, it, the, se the separation and making single layer graphene was done by uh, Nova Seloff. Nova Seloff is the graduate student. He shared the Nobel Prize, but he was the graduate student whose thesis is, is graphene. And this is the professor. And so they did this work, published, public, first publication is November, the very end of the year of 2004, Nobel Prize 2010. Pretty quick, pretty quick, wasn't it? And this is the paper that, that uh, got a lot of publicity uh, because the quantum Hall effect, instead of being integral as it is like galley marcinite normal material, it's half integral. So separation is the same thing. Uh, anyway, many uh, interesting properties. Thinnest material because it's a single sheet. It's very strong because the carbon-carbon bond is the strongest bond in nature. So it's the strongest material you can have. And we've known that for years. But, you know, people now are recognizing that widely. Um, a zero band gap uh, semiconductor. 
And that's because these bands touch together. And so the big challenge is how to make it uh, uh, have a gap, because you want to make a device, you need a band gap, like silicon has band gap, and all the other semiconductors do. It has very high mobility. Now, uh, uh, graphite has a mobility of 30,000 centimeters per volt second. This is about 100,000, actually goes up to a million under proper circumstances. I'll show you some of the things that we've done and other people have done that, that really improve uh, the mobility. And it's a very uh, a high thermal conductor. This is, uh, uh, this is known for a long time, but they like to emphasize it. But carbon by itself has that. You didn't, don't need, uh, don't need uh, graphene. Nanotubes could be similar and high current densities, and that also is common to other forms of carbon. Uh, but the bipolar, that the electrons and holes are symmetric is, is graphene, that's unique, and uh, it's tru truly two-dimensional, and you can modify the band structure. Why? Because you have these touching bands, you put on a perturbation and it breaks mm -hmm. degeneracy. So it's sort of obvious that it's easy to to lift that degeneracy and make it into a, a material with a gap. So a, here's an electric field, you can make a gap. So there are very many interesting properties that are present. Uh, now, back to the Raman spectra. The Raman spectra is really, really unusual. And in, in uh, any elementary course in quantum mechanics uh, for the undergraduates, you learn that uh, your first order gives you some energy eigenvalues, and perturbation th theory should give you something that's very similar with a small difference, because perturbation theory means that it's likely what we start with, with a small tweak. So we just change it by a little bit. However, look what happens here. So this is the first order term. Intensity is very small. Second order term, intensity is huge. So what's going on here? Uh, this material is linear E versus K. We can get, uh, a, when you do spectroscopy, the intensity of spectra go up if you're in resonance with the laser energy. It turns out with graphene, you can be in resonance for not only the initial state, but with all of the, not one of the intermediate states, but all of the intermediate states. So this is, comes about through a triple resonance. This is the only material that has that. So this is very, very unusual. And this is why the spectroscopy of the system is different from anything else. So that, that's a take home message. Linear E versus K intrinsically gives you properties that we don't have in other systems because the energy levels are different, energy momentum relations are different. So any property depends on that, there's no other. That's the fundamentals. So uh, it's got to be different. So you'll remember this. It's a dispersive thing, so we can move uh, with, uh, now why is it dispersive? Dispersive means that when you change the excitation energy of, of the system, uh, you, you involve different wave vectors. So I'm, I'm going to show you now uh, how that works. So here's blue light and you see where the wave vector is. Now I'm going to do it with green light, the same thing. Uh, okay. Okay, there, there's the, the spectrum and everything. And now we're going to do it with green light. You see that it's shifted in energy. It's downshifted. Now we're going to go with red light, see it's downshifted some more. So we can use wave vector change and we can use laser energy change. Those are the two variables that we can we control with the laser, but we activate the, the momentum. So, so that's the way this thing works, and that's the control we have on the properties of graphene. So with a laser, we can control the properties. So externally, we can turn the material's property. That's very, very useful in uh, material science and solid state physics. So, okay, so now we, here's, the, this is now bilayer. And so we have many more lines, and, but we can understand the spectrum. So this is kind of how it looks. Uh, here is, uh, this is uh, the 1-1 transition. 
is one energy, but then when you do the two two transition, it's the large large energy, and so you can see uh, how this thing works, and so we can do all the energies here for the function way vector. I won't bore you with the details, but with the spectroscopists will see how get the idea of how we can work with this and control the energy of momentum. So that that's kind of the key behind it, and all the applications are based on something like this. So here is now putting power into the system, and then we can use that to make transitions between, you can see that, uh, for the different laser energies. Here you have a low laser, e uh, e the energy of, of the photon is low. So the states stay put, but then when we change and get the higher energy, then we can make transitions, induce transitions between them. You can see that we start mixing the states. So uh, we can make, uh, we could study this, even at the dynamics could be studied by power levels in the static case because of the transitions that are made. This is maybe a little bit more complicated and technical than you want to hear, so I'll just get away from it. Here's another thing. Uh, in physics, we have the elementary particles, we have the electrons. A single electron behaves in a certain way and in the elementary course that you take in solid state physics, you, you learn about the physics of the individual electrons. But then when you have a collection of electrons, they don't really behave exactly like the, the individual electrons because they interact with each other. And we can measure that interaction uh, through spectroscopy and other tools to transport. We have many ways of measuring that. And so, for example, here, if we use uh, uh, vary the Fermi level, that is uh, the position of the occupation of the valence and conduction band by uh, changing the voltage applied to the uh, graphene. For example, we could move the um, um, Fermi level up into the conduction band or down in the valence band. So here, here's the technique that's done. So we have gates, we call them gates, shown over here. So this is the ground and here is the voltage on the sample. And so we could look at, here's, here's spectral features, and we can move them around, and that's the kind of research that we're doing nowadays. And we study with all these different features how they change with, with uh, they change energy and momentum as we change the, the uh, uh, energy level, the uh, Fermi level. So we fill electrons and we fill holes, and we watch what happens to the transition. This is getting a little bit uh, complicated. I see people are getting fidgety. So, this is what we do in research nowadays, is we study this, these kinds of behaviors, and we study the effect on the line shape, and we learn a lot of things about graphene by doing that. But much, most of what we learn is how the electrons interact with each other, not the one electron situation, but the situation of how the electrons talk to each other in a simple system, and graphene is about as simple a system as you can get, it's only carbon atoms, and we know exactly what the structure is, so it makes a very nice model system. So that's what we're doing in our research uh, now, and this is uh, the new stuff uh, where, where we do more collective effects than we had before. And uh, the bottom line of this is that the, uh, uh, we can have line shapes that look like this, or we can have line shapes that look like these. So this is the inverted V. And depending on which feature, you get one or the other as we change the Fermi level. Now we're excited about this, but you have to be really into it to understand, appreciate what this tells you about many body interactions. But that's what we're working on right now. So this is, okay, this shows you that sometimes we have a V, and sometimes we have an anti-V, and that makes a big difference to the process, the mechanism that's behind it. Well, another thing that we do uh, uh, is we look at different numbers of layers. So here's more different layers. So, uh, and in this particular experiment, you see little tiny wiggles here. After we get finished looking at these parts, spectral features that are huge. We have little tiny wiggles here. This has a lot of information too. We spend our time looking at these little bumps. 
So this is like high energy physics. People wonder what, what these guys are doing when they go um, uh, to CERN and spend a lot of money. They're doing stuff like this. They're, they're looking at the details of what's happening in nature that really get into the nitty gritty of how the particles are interacting with each other rather than the picture of what an electron is by itself. Okay, en enough said about that. That's the kind of thing that, that we're up to. And now here we have seven layers and we're looking at these little bitty interactions. This is work that we're doing. This is current work. No results yet. But there are many, many features here and you can see they look different for bilayer and, and single layer. This is bilayer, two layers, and this is one layer. They don't look exactly the same. And that means something, and we try to understand that. Okay, now, another thing that, that happens in a system like this is people want to make a band gap because graphene <laughs> is like this. Valence and conduction bands touch. No band gap, no devices. Can't make a device in, like in silicon without a band gap. So how do we do make a, a, a band gap? Well, if you make these ribbons, uh, then you get a bad guy. So we wrote a paper. I had a visitor, a Japanese woman, this women in science. So uh, she was having trouble to find a job. So her professor in Japan said, if she spent a little time in the United States in your lab, maybe we could do, she could do some really interesting work that would help her get a job. So this is what we did. She really did something interesting. At the time, Nobody paid much attention to it, but later uh, it became important. So we, we did a calculation on these ribbons that I showed you in the, in the previous view graph. I'll, I'll go back one uh, just to show you. So there are two kinds of ribbons. There are uh, main symmetry, back to symmetry. Now with Danny Sheckman, back to him with symmetry. So we have these ribbons, and you can see they zigzag here. And this one is armchair. They're all hexagons but the hexagons are oriented in a different way. And they have different kind of energy levels, so let me show you. Uh, these uh, here have a very, I'll show you, have very high density of states, and these don't. So that gives you, that. Uh, let me show you now what it is. So, so the zigzag, that was the ones I was showing you, uh, that have the high density of states, you could see that th we have th these levels flat. That means we have many states with exactly the same energy, so that gives you a high density of states. Now, each state counts for one, so we have 100 states. We have 100 times the amount of, of state, uh, of intensity ha uh, associated, because we have all these states, we all have the same energy. So uh, this gives a high density of states. You could see here's the density of states, and they're very high for the zigzag, but the armchairs don't have this. Here's the armchair, they have nothing like that. So we could distinguish between them. And now, oh, now the important thing that I, met, I have to tell you is that the armchairs will have band gaps, but the zigzags never have band gaps. So we can make somehow armchair that we can have these ribbons, graphene ribbons, with band gaps and we control the band gaps. If you have a thinner band gap, then you have, a, uh, if you have a thinner ribbon, you have a bigger band gap. So that makes this kind of an interesting thing now from a practice. This is this, uh, paper was written in 19, uh, 1996, long time before uh, 2004, and we predicted all these things, but you know, people didn't pay too much attention until after 2004. So if you write a paper and people don't pay attention, don't worry about it. Sometimes it comes back later. Okay, so here's a, a ribbon. And uh, this is, a, and now we're back in the laboratory. So this ribbon is about eight nanometers in, di in, in width. And it's, as you can see, it's long. This is 80 nanometers, so it's a few hundred nanometers long. And uh, so this, this measures the geometry. And a measurement of the spectra is shown over here. And you could see that the ribbon uh, spectra is uh, shifted from the uh, spectra of the substrate, which is, is graphite, and the ribbon is a graphene ribbon. And 
they will, it's, it's the same hexagon, but what happens is that when you, the laser hits the, the, the ribbon, it gets warm because the uh, uh, thermal conductivity in this direction is very poor. The thermal conductivity in this direction is huge. So the difference in conductivity is several orders of magnitude. Uh, not several, several hundred orders of magnitude. So many. Ten to, ten, it's almost 10 to the 3. So very big difference in thermal conductivity. So it, uh, we can heat this uh, the uh, little ribbon and change its frequency. So we can always distinguish the ribbon from the substrate. That's what the trick is in this experiment. And so we do polarization experiments and all that. So we can do the spectroscopy. That's just to show you. And uh, the interesting thing for the uh, uh, band gap is that the armchair edge and the zigzag edge can be easily distinguished by spectroscopy. So we don't have to touch the sample. The samples are micro very, very tiny. They're only nanometers in size. But if you could shine light on them, then we, we can probe them. And uh, so, for example, the uh, a D band, that's a disorder induced band, uh, uh, for an armchair and a zigzag because of the matrix elements. This has to do with quantum mechanics. Uh, I have very different uh, sizes for the matrix elements so that the scattering intensity is very different. The bottom line is you can distinguish them very easily spectroscopically. So we, we know which kind of ribbon we have. We don't have to touch it or anything. We just shine light on it and we, we know the answer. So that's very nice. Uh, so that's about making band gaps in ribbons that we know, basically know, know how to do it. The work is just in early stages. Probably somebody in the laboratory here in microelectronics is doing something like that, but I haven't actually seen the work here. But many other labs, that's also going on. My final uh, uh, couple of slides, I don't have a watch, but you can tell me this time. Okay. Okay, I just, I just go very, very quickly through what I'm trying to say here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show you how to make good edges, because in order to do this, you have to make uh, well-defined zigzag and you know, armchair. How do you do this at, at, at the nano scale? Because we have to do the individual hexagon. So I'll show you what we did. Okay, it'll be less than five minutes. I'm just going to zip through this. So the uh, ribbon that we work with, here's a graphene ribbon. And this is the plane of graphene. And the ribbon comes like this, it's all rolled up. And then we could put electrodes across like this and heat it up. And you put an electrode on top of one side and the bottom of the other side, get a high resistance. So it gets very hot. It goes up to 2,000 degrees approximately. So this is a laboratory sculpture. So we can do the following thing. So, you, when you have a very low voltage, you don't get very much heat, but when the, you increase the voltage, it goes like this, linear, and then it just takes off like crazy. And at this point, the atoms start, carbon atoms start moving along, finding different positions, and they go from this disordered thing here, lights are on, it's a little hard for you to see, and to something that's very ordered. And if you pay attention to the graph, you'll see with more high resolution what's happening. So uh, when you get down to, uh, uh, this is, I don't have a scale here. Well, you can see kind of atoms here. Uh, and so here's the uh, zigzag edge and the armchair edge. You can just follow the pattern so you can see what they have. And um, the edges that you get, this is the edge of one layer and the layer below it. You can see how very nice you can make the edges. You want me to go back one? Go back one. You look confused. So we start out, looks sort of like this mess. We, you don't see any edges. Here you can see very definite, distinct, sharp edges. And, and this is in higher resolution. You can see. Okay, so this is way, one way to make edges. Other people are making those like this now, too. So here, we can distinguish the hexagon armchair edges just by looking at where the atoms are sitting. Very easy. Okay, and then you can watch the edges move, the atoms moving here as you put on the current. We 
just take these pictures sequentially, sequentially and uh, you can watch. Just watch some feature like your knees up. That's what we do. Okay, and uh, that's my story, 50 Years of Carbon. I'm happy to take any questions on any subject we talked about here, starting with uh, Professor, uh, uh, President Levy. Does anybody else have? We take questions. Who has a question? Yeah. It so happened, just by coincidence, that uh, we visited Dick Small a few months before he died yeah. in Rice. And uh, he gave us a special lecture to my wife and myself. And he predicted one day the nanotubes will be used as uh, electrical wire. Yeah. And this was his uh, dream. Vision, dream. Is there any progress along these lines? Yeah. Well, I was showing you some of the applications that are that are are, are beginning uh, with with uh, uh, nanotubes. You know, the, the the early things are, are prosaic. Uh, you put down a bunch of nanotubes on a sheet, make a very thin sheet, and you get a transparent conductor. Okay, that's the beginning of the whole thing. You could make either nanotubes or you can make graphene. Doesn't matter. They both have the same. There's some advantages for one of the different applications. But that, that's, that's already commercialized, those, those processes for companies in different countries that are, are doing that. But that's only the beginning. I, there's so many different properties. It's sort of like the laser. I remember when the laser came in, uh, we all thought that, I mean, people that work with lasers thought, uh, found it so useful to do all the science that we could do uh, with the laser that we couldn't do before. Uh, that uh, there had to be some applications. Whoever thought that would be on the checkout counter for the grocery store at that time, but it took it took 30 years. And for the first 20 years, there were no applications, nothing, and a lot of money was put into uh, lasers. But we c could hardly live without them now, right? Laser point. <laughs> you just mentioned every there's around all around us everywhere. And uh, ma new materials are going to be really important. Uh, uh, now, carbon fibers are a big component of aircraft. The space program could not exist without uh, what I was talking about, the carbon fibers and nanotubes and all of this. They make structural components uh, very light and very strong. But uh, taking advantage of uh, of graphite, but graphite is no good because it crumbles, it falls apart between the layers. But when you make these things like nanotubes, then you can get around those problems. It's the same properties, but in a little different form that allows you to have um, reliability. You know, the space program is all built on reliability. And that, graphite doesn't give you that reliability, but, but fibers do. Yeah, a few more questions. Let's start here and then we'll go back to you. You're next. I'll take it. The simple uh, uh, back of the envelope, back of the envelope, you know, is a Fermi term. Um, uh, we're celebrating uh, somehow him right now. So, uh, uh, if you have a sheet of carbon, the atoms on the surface, nearest thing, uh, the bonds are all taken up. But along the edges, we have many dangling bonds. So these are very reactive sites. So if you can remove um, the atoms and then insert them 
and they can be re reused by something that's more reactive than what you started with, and you have possibility of catalysis. So that, it has to have something to do with the dangling bonds that are not involved in the strong bonding that's already there. So, so that means that you want to make, so now, having given you the principle, what do you want to do? You want to make a lot of these edge sites. You want to have little pieces, small, nano-sized, little tiny flakes of something. See? Then you can maybe go, go into business with that. Very cheap. Very plentiful. Good, good, good that way. Yeah. There was somebody else. Were you the next one? Yeah, please. Oh yes, it's, it's totally, the, um, the linear E versus K that I talked about uh, uh, requires um, uh, hexagonal symmetry. That, that gives you the, the degeneracy, um, it's a topological degeneracy, so that, that forces the valence band and conduction band to be degenerate. And that's what gives you the linear E versus K. So it, it's totally connected with, with the hexagonal form. If you had a square, you wouldn't have that. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. It, you don't have to have graphene because if you have molydisulfa MOS2, you could also have this um, uh, uh, flat plane. And you can also get uh, that kind of a structure. And bismuth, of all things, which you wouldn't think of. Uh, uh, I have a student. I, I asked myself that question. It's a very simple and interesting question. So uh, what happened to me? This is an interesting story. You'll be, you, I think you'll be entertained by it. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, 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 she doesn't work on, on carbon at all. But uh, uh, we work on, on, on energy problems. And, and she's in the Ukraine. So I don't see her. It's only by email. It's the only contact that we have because she's not allowed to travel. So, uh, so she stays there, and uh, she showed me, sent me a spectrum. Not a spectrum, but she sent me some data, and she says, I don't understand. I have all these wiggles, and, uh, and, and, and they're temperature dependent, so what am I looking at? So I, I told her, I think that you made a bismuth that has a zero gap. It was bismuth that she, that she was the material. Uh, I, I told her, well, uh, nobody has ever reported anything like that to my knowledge. So I sent a student, and we looked everywhere in the Burwan zone. Uh, you know, bismuth has very low symmetry. And if you look at certain directions in the Burwan zone, you find a, a linear E versus K. So there must be, a, with, the, with the same degeneracy. So, and, and bismuth is not uh, a hex, hexagon, okay? So it is possible to have, but you have, it, there is a threefold something along the, the axes. But it's not the trigonal axis that shows it. It's actually a lower symmetry. It's a bisectrix and binary axis that we see these uh, linear E versus K and bismuth. And I don't know what other materials, because I haven't tried. But you try, see what you can find. I mean, this is an interesting thing. It, it, it's not only uh, carbon that has it. I, I, I wouldn't have thought to look at bismuth until somebody asked me, but it's true. Yeah. So I'm not the material scientist, as you know, but I'll ask you uh, uh, if you have any advice uh, for living uh, a long and uh, productive uh, life. <laughs> <laughs> long and productive life. Okay, that, 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 that's, well, the, the young people, you'll, you'll, you'll be, be getting older uh, uh, someday. And uh, but, but you're, I'm sure you're, you're asking yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I working so hard? Why am I working all, all these problem sets that you give me every night? Uh, so why am I doing this? Uh, and the reason because is 
because science is so interesting. So uh, uh, you wouldn't, normally you get older, you can retire. And I guess I, I've passed the retirement age <laughs> by now. Uh, most places, it's, huh? No, okay, yeah, well, I'm, I'm telling you how come. Science is one area that you want to, it's so interesting that when you wake up in the morning, you want to do it. And so you, you work for pleasure, not for, it's a job. And there aren't many jobs that people have that's so much fun. So that's what, and it doesn't matter if you're in computer science or you're doing uh, nanotubes or high energy physics, I don't know. All these different things, chemistry. Uh, the discovery of all these unknown of uh, things that, that you never imagined, um, it just keeps you so engaged. I, I come to the lab before six o'clock in the morning. And at my age, I certainly don't have to do that, right? I'm not getting paid to get there at six o'clock in the morning. I never was paid. But I'm so excited about doing it that I'm there. Because I know I have to leave at five o'clock. My husband says, five o'clock, it's time to go home. <laughs> time, time to go home and cook dinner. So, and so, uh, but, but during the day, I can play around. And that's what I want to do. So, so I, I, I tell everybody that if you want to have a job that will entertain you, and people will actually appreciate what you do, because some of the things that you do have an impact on other people's lives, uh, this is a way to do it. So I'm excited about what I'm doing. Either.